before we get, before we get started up, there's a couple of housekeeping notes. Thank you. <laughs> uh, before we get started, just uh, we have two more sessions today. Our keynote speech uh, by Richard Roll, our financial engineer of the year uh, for 2009, who was awarded the uh, dinner the not, was awarded the uh, award at our dinner at the New York Stock Exchange this past February. Uh, just a couple reminders of the IFE press policy is that IFE events are off the record. Uh, reporters that are in presence are welcome to approach the panelists afterward and have them go on record. Uh, also that uh, the comments are of the panel, of the panelists themselves, not necessarily that of their companies, and that applies to all IFE events. So just a quick reminder there. Uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Richard Roll, who will take the next hour. He uh, has about, I think, about a 30-minute presentation, 35 minutes, followed by Q&A. I would remind you during the Q&A, if you'd like to ask a question, make sure to push the button in front of the mic so that everyone can hear uh, your question. Uh, at 4.30, we'll go straight into our final session, which is the high-frequency trading session. Uh, with that, I will hand it over to uh, Professor Roll. Thank you. Working? Okay. Um, well, I would like to first start out thanking David and the other organizers, Mark and so on, and the, and the International Association for uh, giving me this uh, great honor and also letting me know that I was a financial engineer, which I hadn't really been aware of before. Uh, <laughs> before receiving the award. Uh, uh, some of you earlier, I was here talking about whether financial engineers are really real engineers and so on. Remember that conversation we had in the, in the earlier session today? Um, I actually am a real engineer. I was an aeronautical engineer and built airplanes and, and rockets and stuff before I switched over to finance. So, uh, I, I don't see that there's that much difference, although, like Andy Lowe said, there's a lot more uncertainty in the kinds of things that we do relative to, let's say, building an airplane. Although, I tell you what, when I worked on the Saturn rocket to go to the moon, I had a lot of doubts that that thing was going to get there <laughs> and back. <laughs> it turned out pretty well, but, uh, you, know, you know, the probability, you know, the a priori probability that I thought in my mind was... Uh, not so good. And, and by the way, after I worked on the 727 at Boeing for, as a designer, I refused to fly on it for five years. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I don't feel too badly about things that are going on in financial engineering, to tell you the, to tell you the truth. Um, the, um, as, you, as you see in your uh, outline, my topic today is uh, about the crisis. And in a way, this is not really financial engineering. It's more pure finance and, and a little bit of macroeconomics thrown in. But I think you can see that uh, financial engineers uh, should have a great interest in this because they've been blamed in some quarters for the whole problem. And uh, so uh, what I want to do is to try to uh, give you a, a different viewpoint of what's happened in the last several years, starting in 2007 and still going on today, and I'm afraid it's going to be continuing for into the indefinite future unless something is done about it. Um, and the, my topic is going to be to first talk about really what is the proper diagnosis of what went wrong, and I'll show you what my analysis is of this, of this question. And you see that the title of the talk is The Possible Misdiagnosis of a Crisis. And I emphasize the word possible because I'm in Andy Lowe's column to the right. Remember that? Where we're the most uncertain about everything. Uh, and all the way down in the right-hand corner. And uh, so we're going to see that that's about as, as good as we can do. And I want to warn you that... Um, what you're going to hear from me today is quite unorthodox. I don't think you will have heard something like this from anybody else. And they're just my, uh, they're just my ideas. And I can't blame them on anybody else. And much of what I have to conclude about the crisis will strike a lot of you as complete nonsense. They're certainly very radical ideas uh, compared to what you see out there in the, in the economic. And I don't have much empirical proof. A little bit, a little bit, but mainly these are conclusions based on a few basic principles. And 
after Andy's talk this morning, I'm a little bit reluctant to use the word principle in the context of finance because he argued that you know, our R squares are 1 minus 0.999. Uh, so I'm not sure whether uh, we have such a thing as a principle. I think we actually do have a couple of principles that we could all agree on and that and we can use those principles, as, you, as you'll see in a moment, I think, to deduce something about what happened in the crisis. Um, so I want you to reserve judgment a little bit because what you're going to hear is a bit radical and you probably will think they're implausible, but at least keep an open mind. Let's just think about the possibility, the alternative possibility that, uh, that I'm going to present you in a second is having at least some chance, some small chance possibly of being uh, at least reasonable. Well, what is the current diagnosis and the treatment that we have for the crash? Well, first of all, I want to point out that the patient is still ill. The unemployment rate in this country is hovering around 10%. It doesn't show any signs of getting better. Uh, so what we need to do, the first step, and we have an ill patient, is we have to correctly diagnose what the underlying cause is of the illness. Uh, and, of course, then we have to come up with a proper treatment for the diagnosed illness. And is, in good medical practice, those two things are very closely aligned because if we do an incorrect diagnosis and we institute a treatment, it can often do more harm than good, uh, more harm than even doing nothing because a lot of patients just recover spontaneously, including economies. And my theme is really that there's a, a good case to be made that the underlying cause of the current global crisis has been misdiagnosed and that the current treatment may be doing more harm than good. Well, what is the current diagnosis? What are the things that we've heard from, in the popular press and by academics writing books about them, which now there have been a plethora? We have government officials making pronouncements and so on. What are the diagnoses that have been offered? Well, the attending physicians, all these people I mentioned, like the academics and the government officials and so on, I call them the attending physicians. They, uh, they're not totally in agreement, of course, but some of the most prominent things that we've heard in the, as being the causes of this crisis are things like the subprime mortgage meltdown. There's no question about that we had a subprime mortgage meltdown. The issue is whether or not that's an underlying cause of the total crisis. Another thing is we've, there are too much leverage, or there was too much leverage in financial institutions. Inadequate regulation. Well, the Congress right now is considering incredible amounts of additional regulation to deal with the, the sickness of the patient. You know, that's still an ongoing process. We've had another thing. There's been an excessive use of complex derivatives. You know, pe too, people spent too much time on hard to understand complex things like CDSs and you know, tranches like Mr. Hull was talking about a few moments ago and things like that. There was excessive risk taking by uh, uh, financial institutions that was induced by agency conflicts. That is, the managers had a short term perspective and they were willing to take risk knowing that they were taking risk because there was an agency conflict between the long term perspective of the shareholders and of the whole country and the short-term decisions that they were making. There was easy money. There were low interest rates. And those low interest rates, according to Alan Greenspan, no less, caused a bubble in the housing market. So we had an incredible run-up in housing. In fact, a bubble, he said, and that bubble was induced by these low interest rates. So those are the current diagnosis. I mean, they're not, that's not a, a completely comprehensive list, but I think you probably have all heard one or more of those things being discussed as serious contenders for the underlying situation. Well, what about the treatment? What are we doing about the, the illness? Well, in the United States, we engage in bailouts of distressed financial institutions. We accelerated the rate of monetary growth we engage in massive federal borrowing and spending, which is, as you know, has caused probably the highest deficit this past year in the history of the world. Higher taxes are on the agenda and additional regulation. Those things are all treatments that we have, or various people in our country have um, 
specified for the patient. And in other countries, all of, many of which also underwent a similar crisis of varying proportions, one or more of those above treatments is also being undertaken, although in different proportions and different amounts. Not everywhere, though. Some, some places and some countries, nothing is being done. So it's not true that every country that experienced a fairly severe crisis in the last few years is engaged in one of these things. But in the United States, we're doing the things that I put up there. <clears throat> well, let me now turn to three diagnostic principles that I think we can use to analyze and try to figure out what is the true underlying cause of the crash. And again, as I, I say with some trepidation, principles, these are financial principles, but I think in some cases, all of you in the room will agree on at least two of these. The third one it will take a little bit more persuasion. So let me tell you what those three principles are. And you, you'll, you'll, you'll kind of laugh when you see the first one because it's obvious. And it is that the aggregate value of debt is zero. You ever think about that? Because for every borrower, there's a lender. So if we added up all the balance sheets of everybody in the world, governments, firms, private individuals, and so on, for every liability on somebody's balance sheet, there's an asset on some other entity's balance sheet. We add up all the balance sheet of everybody. We get the aggregate global balance sheet. What's the amount of debt on that balance sheet? Zero. There is no debt in the aggregate balance sheet of all entities in the world. The same thing is true of derivatives contracts, because for every buyer of a derivatives contract, there's a seller of a derivatives contract. So if you mark them to market every day, and you mark to market the balance sheets every day of all the entities in the world, you add them all up, zero is the aggregate amount of derivatives outstanding. So when you, when you think about that aggregate balance sheet, you know, this, this principle, which uh, it, it's not really much more than just an accounting identity, really, says that the, global, the global, ba global balance sheet that includes all the real assets in the world does not have an entry on it for debt or derivatives. Zero. Okay. Now, if anybody wants to argue with that, I can get my friend who's a partner at, at uh, one of the big four, accounting, big four accounting firms to come in and explain it in more detail, but it doesn't really need any explanation, I don't think. Well, what's the second principle? Second principle is that financial markets are forward-looking. In other words, when we look at valuation today of different financial assets, what do those valuations depend on? Well, they depend on people's forecasts of what the cash flows and other benefits and costs are going to be of holding those assets. Past, the past is irrelevant except insofar as it allows you to develop better anticipation of the future, but the valuation of financial assets is strictly a forward-looking problem. And, you know, even, even if we admit things like behavioral finance and so on, they still, that still applies in that case where we have irrationalities entering in, future irrationalities and so on, entering into the value of those assets. The third principle, which is the one that I think you'll have the biggest trouble accepting, but uh, I think that we have plenty of empirical evidence about, is that the prosperity of a country follows from what I call here economic liberalization, for want of a better term. But basically what I mean by that, it's the fraction of the total output of the country that is spent by the private sector versus the public sector. So, for instance, if we thought about changing the size of the public sector spending in the country from, let's say, 40% of GDP to 50% of GDP, that has a very reliable effect on the aggregate wealth of the country. By the aggregate wealth, I mean by adding up all the balance sheets of all the entities in the country and look at the bottom line, the equity on that balance sheet. And the effect is pretty large, historically speaking. So generally speaking, when we get we reduce the fraction, the private fraction of total spending by 20%, it reduces aggregate wealth 
by about 50%. So what I mean by a 20% change in private spending, suppose that suppose the public spending was 30% and that went to 50%. That's a 20% change in public spec spending versus private spending. That I claim historically will cause a country's wealth to decline by 50%. Now it works both ways. We'll, and I'll give you some examples of that in the future, but that I don't know of a single exception in history or in development economics where you've ever seen it go the other direction where you have these big changes in the private and public sector. So those are the three principles. I don't think you'll have any trouble with the first and second one. The third one is an empirical regularity, which I don't completely understand myself, but the evidence is pretty strongly in favor of it. Now, with those three principles, I want to go on and talk about what happened in this latest uh, situation. Well, let's talk about wealth transfers and the crash. Could a wealth transfer cause the market to crash? Let me give you an example. Suppose Warren Buffett gave Bill Gates $20 billion. Okay. He actually did this, right? Well, what would happen? What's the net change in aggregate wealth of this happening? Zero, because we add together the balance sheets of everybody. The 20 billion just transferred from, from Buffett to Gates. Would markets crash if they did this? Would even the, would human capital, we added up all the human capital in the world, would it be worth less? Would uh, real estate values fall? Well, they might fall a little in Omaha and rise in Seattle, but you know, we add them all up, they would pretty much. So would there be any direct impact on the existing stocks of productive machinery, goodwill, or any other real asset from a transfer such as this one here? Well, I think you can see when you think about it in that kind of a context that no, it's obvious that you know just a transfer from one person to another is not going to, at least in the first order, it's not going to affect the bottom line of the aggregate balance sheet if we add up everybody's balance sheets in the, in the economy. So principle number one, which is debt and derivatives are in zero net supply, Tell us something about that. Well, globally, there's a lender for every borrower, a seller for every buyer of a derivatives contract. The liability on somebody's balance sheet is exactly matched by the entity on uh, an asset on somebody else. And same for derivatives. I've already talked about that. So they cancel out an aggregate. That leaves only real assets on the aggregate balance sheet. What are those real assets? Well, real estate, machinery, equipment, buildings, intangibles such as goodwill, and of course human capital, which is probably the biggest real asset of all, the aggregate value of all of us in the world is a, a tremendous real asset that's very hard to value and hard to understand. But the bottom line is that real wealth doesn't include any debt or any derivatives. So the implications of that are that any change in the quantity of outstanding debt or of a derivatives contract has no direct impact on aggregate real wealth. It's always zero in the aggregate balance sheet, so if we change the amount of it outstanding, it doesn't affect the aggregate balance sheet. So that what this implies is that every default is really a wealth transfer. It's a transfer from a lender to a borrower. Okay. So this is true of all credit events. For instance, delinquency in a mortgage or insolvency in a bank or a bankruptcy is really a wealth transfer. It's a transfer from a person who's extended credit to another entity and has not received the promised payments in, in return. Every derivatives contract exercise is also the same. It's just a wealth transfer from the person who's made money in the derivatives contract to the person who's lost money in the derivatives contract. And it has no first order direct implication for aggregate real wealth. So let's take subprime mortgages. Well, they're often spotlighted as one of the triggering events of the recent crisis. A lot of people said, well, they just didn't represent enough, a big enough 
piece of the debt market to have really triggered the crisis. But what I'd like to say is, independent of that, even if they had been much bigger than they were in aggregate, regardless of their size, think about the following two wealth transfers. Suppose that a borrower defaulted on a $300,000 subprime mortgage and the recovery value of the foreclosed property was $200,000. That's one wealth transfer. Okay. I'm claiming that that's exactly the same thing as if the lender in that subprime mortgage had awakened one day, gone to the bank and withdrawn $100,000 and handed it over to the homeowner of the subprime who was sitting in the property of some prime mortgage. Those two events are identical in terms of their impact on the wealth of the lenders and, and, and borrower in that transaction. The lender has lost $100,000 and the borrower has made $100,000. Of course, in the subprime mortgages, I'm abstracting from taxes and transactions costs just uh, and that, but in both cases, the borrower's wealth increases, the lender's wealth decreases by $100,000. So when you think about the subprime mortgage default, in the first instance, if the, if the net loss to the, to the lender is $100,000, it's identical to a transaction where they, the lender just goes and gets $100,000 and just delivers it to the borrower in cash. It's the same effect on their to wealth positions, and there's, of course, no effect on the aggregate wealth position. So let's think about the implications of that. There's no direct impact on real wealth in aggregate of this, but a wealth transfer. But what about associated tertiary events? For instance, the default itself was probably triggered by a reduction in the value of real estate. What caused that reduction? Well, the subprime mortgage borrower wouldn't have defaulted unless the value of the real estate had fallen somewhat below what they owed on the subprime mortgage. So underneath that wealth transfer, there probably was a real asset that changed in value and triggered that transfer. But you've got to remember the transfer itself was not the cause of the wealth reduction. It was the result of the wealth reduction because real estate is a real asset and the real estate value fell. Now, what caused that reduction in wealth is an is a interesting question. I'll return to that in a moment. But let me just point out first that the, the lender's wealth reduction, when a subprime mortgage occurs, it might trigger defaults in other liabilities. So for instance, suppose the lender is IndyMac Bank. IndyMac Bank has, some, has borrowed money from other people. And so when a subprime mortgage defaults for them, they may have to default on some, other, on some other lender to them so that there's a propagation of wealth transfers that's initiated by this original default. No doubt about that. The original wealth transfer can trigger other wealth transfers. But remember that since in aggregate, wealth, the total amount of debt is zero, no matter how many wealth transfers are propagated through by that first one, is still, they're all still just wealth transfers and don't enter into the bottom line of real assets. Um, the, the decline in the mortgage property's value is the sole loss in aggregate real wealth. But, of course, those losses can be tri to trigger other uh, transfers throughout the economy. Now, one question then goes, could a propagation like that a chain of events of wealth transfers, could that itself lead to the further declines in the real value of assets? In other words, could we somehow have a, an impact on real asset values at the bottom line of this aggregate balance sheet because of this chain of wealth transfers that people have incurred? It? Well, we all agree that that wouldn't have happened if Bill Gates got $20 billion from Warren Buffett. So my question is, why would it happen when you know, Andy Mack got lost money to a mortgage borrower and then had to trigger other transfers like that as well. That's still a, an open question, though, I admit, and we'll return to that in a, in a bit. Well, let's take another explanation, excessive leverage. Well, we know that a lot of financial institutions had a lot of leverage, still do, 
the many people have pointed out these very high leverage levels as an underlying cause of the crash and there's no doubt that if you increase leverage in your financial interest institution you don't do anything except have higher leverage it increases the probability that you're going to have to you're going to go into financial distress at some point and you're going to have to uh, have a problem if things turn against you in the real asset market but again if you had a default because you had this higher leverage that's still a wealth transfer so it's similar to a subprime borrower itself so the underlying triggering event I'm arguing has to do with a somewhere somewhere in the economy a value reduction in a real asset and perhaps that's propagated through the economy and you a financial institution with a tremendous leverage ratio are set there and slammed by this thing that suddenly hits you uh, unexpectedly but it's not the leverage itself that's the cause of this it's that's a cause of additional wealth transfers but not cause of an underlying change in real asset values what about credit derivatives well we've heard a lot about CDOs MBSs similar derivatives often mention or blame for the crash but like everything else that are debt contracts and derivatives there are assets to some liabilities to others and their aggregate value is zero they're not part of aggregate real, real wealth and so we don't we couldn't expect them to have an impact at least a first order impact on any real wealth uh, construct what about low interest rates in the housing bubble Alan Greenspan's explanation well in this case what we see is in the in the period leading up to the the crash that really started in sometime in the middle of 2007 nominal interest rates really were indeed historically low but real interest rates were not let me show you that for a second so in a second I'll show you what real interest rates look like so if if low interest rates led to a housing bubble it has to be because people had money illusion and confused real interest rates with nominal interest rates of course real interest rates are the things that we should use to discount real property values that should be the thing that we use to figure out what the value of real estate is well what were the yields on real interest on real securities in the period leading up to the crash this chart here starts in January 2003 and ends in the middle of 2007 that's the five-year yield on tips Treasury invested protected securities over that time period and of course as you know the yield on tips are basically the probably the best thing we have to get an idea of what the real interest rates are and I pick five-year tips because five-year mortgages would be closely associated in terms of their real interest rates with these tip yields well let's see what happened there this is a this is a level of one percent this is one and a half percent so in the period where the great housing bubble happened real interest rates went up from one percent to two and a half percent they went up by hundred and fifty basis points exactly when the housing bubble was supposed to be expanding so there's no evidence based on this that that a low real interest rate caused the housing bubble quite to the contrary real interest rates were rising during the period of the bubble just to show you a whole term structure of interest rates and over a little longer period here's the five-year seven-year ten-year and 20-year tips yield starting in January 03 that's January 3 this is the peak of the housing bubble in the middle of 2007 and then when the housing market crashed real interest rates fell dramatically well if it's a low real interest rate that's causing increased housing prices how come when they went down like a like crazy housing prices fell at the same time right? now later true when when as the you can see that there's a big blip here when it looked like maybe the US could even default on its bonds but you can see that real interest rates here are actually lower except for this one blip than they were at the at the peak of the housing crisis they're they've been consistent pretty much lower afterwards so uh, 
you know, I don't think that the evidence at all supports the proposition that there was a, a housing bubble, at least a housing bubble that was induced by extraordinarily low interest rates. To the contrary, you have interest rates going in the same direction as housing prices, both prior to the, the, the crash and after the crash. It's not the other way around. Well, let's think about going back to this wealth transfer alone. Can, can wealth transfers alone cause reductions in aggregate real wealth? That's the question that we have to work with. Well, I think at first glance it seems preposterous because if some entities handed over money to other entities, why would there be a reduction in real wealth? But what about the psychological thing? We've heard a lot about behavioral finance. Andy was talking about it earlier today. What if a deterioration in the credit market can have a psychological impact and cause reassessments of future cash flows on real assets? What if there is this psychological possibility? Well, if that's the diagnosis that we have for the crash, it's a diagnosis that the patient is psychosomatically ill. Hmm? Well, it could be. Maybe we just are all crazy. And there's no real you know, illness at all here. It's just that people are just infected with this uh, thing. So, you know, psychosomatic illness is notoriously difficult to treat, and there's a very risky possibility that you will give the wrong treatment. So if, you, if a patient comes in and, and is delirious and the doctor concludes, well, you know, they're just having some kind of crazy reaction of a psychosomatic illness, and then he prescribes Valium, it turns out that the patient really has a brain tumor, you're in serious trouble, right? So the thing is, this, I, I admit that it's always easy to blame everything on psychosomatic things, and you can never rule that out. But on the other hand, the danger of accepting that unequivocally is that you, all, you rule out a treatment of a genuine illness that you could have cured uh, with something better. And I think that's the danger of this. And I think there's a non-psychosomatic diagnosis available, and perhaps it's even more plausible, which is that reductions in real asset values are inducing wealth transfers across participants in debt and derivatives market. In other words, you see the causative arrow here, reductions in the value of real assets inducing wealth transfers, which are causing defaults and problems in the debt and derivatives market. All right, let me turn, I'm going to get back to that in a second, but let me turn to principle number two. Financial markets are forward-looking. So under financial market, I want to include any market that establishes a value based on the capitalization of future cash inflows. Well, we know that equity markets satisfy this. They cap, equity markets capitalize future dividends. Real estate markets capitalize future implicit rents. And human capital markets do this too because they the value of human capital, the value of us as an individual, each person, is basically the capitalized future value of labor incomes. I'm talking about the economic value, not the value of the human being, but the economic value is the capitalized future labor income. So a fundamental principle is that the current value depends on anticipations about the future, and anything in the past is sunk cost. Now you see what I'm getting to with this is that I'm trying to see on these real assets like equity markets, real estate markets, human capital markets, can we pinpoint to some reason why they might have lost value? That, if, if one of those markets did lose value in the period just preceding the crash, that could have precipitated all the things that we observe in the debt markets and so on. Mm -hmm. So. Real estate values begin to decline in late 2007 and early 2008. Some people attribute that to the bubble, but as I've shown you before, if it was a bubble, it probably wasn't an interest rate induced bubble. There was no increase in aggregate debt over the previous decade. Why not? There couldn't have been because aggregate debt is zero. The value of aggregate is always zero. Real interest rates actually increased in the 2000s and mortgage rates became even lower during the crash and remained low. But we have a decline in real asset values. So the issue is why? I think we can rule out interest rates as the cause of that. 
But it's, there's no doubt that the real estate market crashed in 2007 and continued to do through 2008. Why did that happen if it wasn't a bubble in the, in the bursting of a bubble? What caused housing prices to fall? Well, what are some of the other main drivers behind housing prices other than interest rates? And the answer to that very clearly is human capital. You can think about, think about human capital and the very close connection they have to housing values. People can afford to pay for their houses some fraction of their lifetime discounted present values and income. We all know that we have a limit based on their human capital, our incomes and so on, of how much of a house we can afford. And it's obvious when you look cross-sectionally at the wealthier people having the more expensive houses and so on. So one of the main driving factors in real estate, in the real estate market, is the value of human capital. So that one thing we might want to consider is there some possibility that this particular factor, the value of human capital, in aggregate for some reason fell in the period leading up to the housing crash, and that's really the underlying precipitating cause of this. Perhaps there was a sudden negative shock in the value of human capital in 2007. And of course, human capital is part of aggregate real wealth, and it's also a major factor in housing prices. Now, the, the, the one, the, 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 I think probably that the, the human capital values are so closely connected to housing values that the best measure we have of human capital value is the real estate market, really because those two things are so closely connected, and they're more closely connected than equity values are, fixed income values are, with human capital. So let me digress a bit and talk about observing real asset values. We have a problem with human capital, unlike other forms of real assets. For instance, we can, we can observe machinery and equipment and tangibles because, because we can look at the equity market. The equity market tells us a lot about the value of those kinds of real assets. We can also observe real estate values, but not, very, not as well as equity values. You know, the Case-Shiller indexes and the other indexes from Ofeo and so on we have for housing in the United States are defective to say the least, but at least we have some idea of what's happening in the real estate market. Foreign, in foreign markets, we have not as, even as good an idea for real estate, but at least real estate is partially observable. What about human capital? Well, we can't look up in the Wall Street Journal or, or in Bloomberg anything about the value of human capital. It doesn't exist. We have to impute it from long afterward for what we can see happen to incomes, labor incomes and, and other kinds of income from, to, to human labor uh, after the fact. But we know that in advance of the fact, every individual is got an idea of what their lifetime earnings are going to be and got an idea of what the value of the, that, the present value of those lifetime earnings are. We, don't, we can't, though, as economists, have any idea directly of, what that, of what's causing that. So I would think the real estate market is probably the next best way we have of looking at that. So here's my unorthodox chronology of what really happened in the period leading up to this period. First, human capital value declined and precipitously from mid to late, 2000, late 2007 through 2008 because anticipated growth rate in labor income declined. That wasn't observed because we don't observe human capital value, and it could not have been. But what I want you to think about is that, and I've put it in red here, if the anticipated growth rate of labor income is relatively close to the discount rate that people use to discount their labor income, even a small decrease in the growth rate anticipated can have a big impact on value. You know the Gordon growth model is the value is equal to the dividend divided by the discount rate minus the growth rate. Okay? So let's say the discount rate is 4% and the growth rate of human capital is 3%. Let's say that growth rate falls, in anticipated growth rate falls from 3% to 2%. What's the impact on the value of human capital for that 1% decline in the growth rate of human capital? 
Okay. The values of a 1% change in anticipated growth rate on the value of human capital is 33% of the value of human capital. It doesn't take a very big change in anticipated lifetime growth of labor income to cause a big change in the value of human capital. So real estate values, this is the next step in my unorthodox chronology, human capital growth rate declined a little bit, but values declined a lot, and real estate values responded to that, either concurrently or with a short lag, which is, of course, hard to measure, and those values declined with the value of human capital because people realized they could not afford that. Equities also fell. That happened, though, in response to the change in real estate values and human capital values. So people in the equity market saw real estate happen, doing that. They, they understood that since human capital growth rates went down, that probably consumption would decrease in the future and corporate earnings would decline, and so the, the equity markets declined as well. Well, if that chronology has any validity, we may have collectively misdiagnosed the debt markets as the underlying cause of the crisis, whereas they are simply the sneeze that's caused by this virus. Right? So we as uh, diagnosticians, you know, have to pay some attention to this possibility, I think. But here's the question. If the chronology is valid, why did human capital fall in value, thereby precipitating this cascade and declines of real assets and these wealth transfers in the debt market? And there are two possibilities, I think. One possibility is the market for human capital is just completely irrational. It's a bunch of behavioral folks just changing their minds suddenly about what their lifetime incomes are going to be. And you can't rule that out. It's possible that people just get in a frenzy and just wake up one morning and say, oh, my God, you know, the value of my human capital, just the growth rate went down by 1%. Yeah. And, of course, that's always a possibility. Everybody doing that at the same time seems less likely, but, but who knows. What about another possibility, that they fell because the anticipated growth rate in labor income really did decline for good reason? Remember, we don't need a very big decline to cause a big effect on value. What if that really happened? Well, I don't have any proof that that happened. How could I? Because we can't look up human capital values in the Wall Street Journal. But I think there's plenty of reason to suspect that it's a genuine possibility. And here's what I think might have happened. My conjecture is the market got it right, that Markets are forward-looking, and in 2007, they began to suspect a major restructuring of the U.S. economy and also a number of other economies, although not all economies around the world. What that, what that restructuring involved? It was that the U.S. private sector's fraction of GDP was going to decline relative to the public sector fraction. In other words, in 2007, people saw what was coming, but not just in the U.S., there was kind of a sea change in the attitudes of people f around the world about the sizes of the private versus public sector going forward uh, in the future. Um, if they turned out to be right, then the bailouts started by the previous administration continued by the current one, and br which brought the largest deficit in history. And that doesn't even count the anticipated expansion in public sectors such as the health plan. Okay? Now remember, we're talking about the size of the public sector versus the private sector and the anticipated size and the effect on that of that on anticipated growth rates in labor income. So I think this same trend is occurring in, in a number of other countries, perhaps not in Brazil, China, and India, but certainly in Europe and in many other countries around the world. Well, that gets us to principle number three. Remember, I started off with that at the very beginning. What that principle says is that prosperity or the value of aggregate real wealth depends on the fraction of public spending versus private spending. There have been numerous recent examples 
of that working both ways. For instance, we have Chile, China, India, Ireland in recent period, whose real wealth increased by a factor of four after economic liberalization, where the private sector grew relative to the public sector. We have numerous examples of countries that went the other direction and that experienced a decline in wealth by a factor of four and even more after the public sector grew relative to the private sector. A few examples there, such as some real uh, stellar performers, such as Argentina, Cuba, and Zimbabwe. But, you know, you could, there are numerous other examples that we have from development economics, and there are no counterexamples, really, that people have come up with. In the U.S., the equity markets declined, quote, only 50% in 2008. And real estate and human capital values also declined, perhaps as much, although they're hard to measure. But a decline of 50%, remember, is not that big relative to what other countries have seen happen when they get a change in the size of the public sector. What happened in 2009? Well, in some countries, India and China, it was a good year. It was a pretty good year in the equity market in the U.S., although not in the labor market. The China and India public sectors are not growing relatively. They were hurt by other countries in 2008, but they recovered pretty well. In the U.S., why did the stock market partly recover? Well, because the chances of an increased increase in the size of the public versus the private sector went down. The anticipation of the, that, you know, decreased in 2009. You, you, you see that the, chan that the, uh, the causes that were led to the original thing, you know, the story that my chronology here is, w explains also this partial recovery because it says people's labor cap, pe people's human capital values actually went back up a little bit in 2009 because their anticipated growth rate of labor income went back up a little bit because they didn't think that the chances of a higher public sector, private sector fraction were as bad as they thought they were at the end of 2008. Um, and so assets partly rebounded. However, thus far in 2010, we still have a relatively sick patient. It's, we have a high rate of unemployment and languorous consumer spending. Both of those things have to do with labor income. The consumer spending in particular has been very disappointing and the unemployment rate's not so good either. So my question is, what if the current treatment is exacerbating the symptoms and delaying the recovery? Remember we talked about those treatments that are being uh, undertaken here for this patient. Um, what if the very anticipation of the continued use of these treatments is actually leading to worse symptoms? And are the elected and appointed economic diagnosticians essentially advising the extraction of blood from a feverish patient? That's the thing that I'm wondering. Well, what's the alternative? You know, if that's, if that's really the, the true story of the illness, what should, what should be done instead to help this sick patient recover? Well, obviously, if the story is correct, we should change the relative size of the public and private sector to increase the latter. We should reverse this trend. That means reducing taxes and government spending. And the question is whether this is feasible given the current composition of the attending physicians. I don't think it is if, uh, if, they, um, if we don't get another opinion. Now, what happens if we don't get another opinion? What's, what's the future have in store? Well, I think there are many examples in history of a similar situation, and I think one that's kind of the closest to ours in the current situation is what happened in Great Britain after the end of World War II. From 1946 until 1979, Great Britain was the worst performing economy in Europe. You remember being in Britain in this period? The continent was doing very well. England was in terrible situation. It had high unemployment rate, a high level of public sector spending relative to private sector spending, and it was in stagnation and remained in stagnation for more than 30 years. It was only around 
1979, when Thatcher was elected prime minister, that this reversed. In, in a short time period, Britain went from the worst performing country in Europe to the best performing country in Europe during the Thatcher administration. Well, if this, is, if this is, has a bearing on our situation now, and what it means is that we can look for relief from the current illness in about the year 2040, another 30 years of our current situation. Keep the treatment going, and that's what we have to look forward to. Thank you. Uh, we have questions, and push the button. Yes, I was wondering how your conjecture um, is able to explain the very sharp rise in real estate prices from 2000 to 2007 when deficits were going up. Why was there a rise in real estate prices? Yeah, yeah. because uh, okay. public expenditure was still rising yeah. during that period. Well, I think probably in that period there was a somewhat of an increase in the growth rate, anticipated growth rate of human labor income in that period. I don't think it's interest rates because, as I showed you there, the real interest rate went in the same direction as housing price. What's, what are the other factors that cause real estate prices to go up? Human capital is the principal other factor. So, you know, you deduce from the evidence something about the underlying factor that does it. Probably it's the growth rate of labor income in that period. But that was reversed in uh, 2007. Public versus private... Uh, component of spending was going in the same direction then as it was after the... Yeah, it, it, it was, but not not as much as it's done since then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd just like to tell you my experience. Uh, you say you didn't have much experience with this, but, um, you know, I have participated in the mortgage business, auto lending business, and so forth, and um, I think your assessment is uh, essentially wrong. Uh, based on my personal experience, you know, um, when I was speaking with borrowers in 2005, a borrower who had uh, $50,000 in income, not to, I, not wasn't I wasn't lending to him, uh, bought a $500,000 house, and I said, how do you expect to pay for this? And he said, I'm going to sell it next year for $600,000. So uh, based on, um, it, it was clearly a uh, speculative bubble having nothing to do with his income um, at all or his anticipated income at all. Uh, furthermore, in terms of interest rates, you mentioned Greenspan, but you didn't mention Bernanke's uh, discussion about, uh, you know, the, the Taylor rule. But uh, without going even anything near uh, what uh, economics that you're talking about, because of the availability of um, on, you know, these types of no stated loans and no income and so forth, borrowers are simply paying uh, an economic speculation game, uh, which uh, there was a unrealistic increase in house prices followed by a decrease in house prices as uh, people began to realize they could, they were the last person in the musical chair. Um, so I'm not sure anything you said has any real validity. I don't, I don't have any uh, doubt that housing prices were the, I think you agree with this, that the housing price fall was a precipitating event in the crash. You're, you have a different explanation, though, for why housing prices went up and then why they went down. Remember, uh, Mr. Uh, the gentleman was here this morning. He also I, I don't think anybody disagreed that there was a housing price bubbling down. There's nothing you said about that that's in any way new. What you were talking about that was new, uh, you just left it off your list, but it was nothing new. Um, what you, let, you just wanted to relate it to some kind of labor and, and political argument, and, and I didn't find anything like that in real life. No, no, I, I, I wanted to first try to dismiss the causative effect coming from the debt market. Remember we started out saying is leverage or is leverage default or is the prime mortgage meltdown the problem or is the prime mortgage meltdown the, the result of the housing market? No, nobody, nobody said that if people uh, pay their debt it causes the issue and you're just honestly uh, kind of 
playing with words saying, well, debt versus price. Obviously, if they can't, if their price isn't there and they can't sell the house, they can't pay the debt. So you're just leaving off one step. Uh, so anyway, bottom line is um, I don't think anything you said had any validity. Well, I'm glad you kept an open mind. <laughs> I appreciate that. Okay. Yes, sir. Well, like yourself, I started out as an engineer, so I believe in checking for boundary conditions. Do you believe that eliminating the public sector altogether will create immense wealth, getting rid of public schools and teachers and everything else? No, of course not. Wouldn't that create immense wealth uh, if you follow the uh, argument? No, in fact, the, the evidence is that there are, some, there's, there are many poor countries around the world in Africa and places like that, where there's not a big enough public sector because the public sector needs to be big enough to have infrastructure, schools, and things like that. After a certain point, though, that turns the other direction. It's not, it's not a linear thing that goes from zero to, to nirvana, but you know, very low public sector is just as bad <laughs> as a very high public sector. But in the middle range, you have uh, you have this effect that I'm talking about, like in the 20, 30, 40, 50 percent range where the European economies and we are. And do you have any empirical numbers as to where that number should be for a, a country like ours? Well, if, if you go from, we're, we're around, we're in the 30s now. We can take total federal, state, local government. If, if that went up 10 percent, the, the aggregate real wealth would come down 50 percent. That's, that's the number that development economics uh, economists talking about. But if you, if you went from zero to 10, it would go up a lot because you'd then start building infrastructure. If you, if you go though from, if you, if you go from 80 to 100, what would it do? <laughs> <laughs> so you see that's not a, I, I simplified that function, but then, yes sir. Hi, your story is very similar to Amity Schley's diagnosis of the persistence of the Great Depression through the 30s. Do you recognize that connection? I know the is name. I haven't heard her. I haven't read her. I know she has a book on that. Yeah. I have, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Let's say lenders lend to two kind of people, borrower, or consumers and business people. Now, changes... Persistent changes in uh, human capital occur from either productivity growth, you know, marginal productivity growth, or disruptive technology. Mm -hmm. Usually that doesn't come from consumers. That comes from business people, right? Uh, if there is a massive transfer of wealth from lenders to consumer borrowers, and this is not a gift, a gift would have different psychological effects than a default. Mm -hmm. If there is a large transfer of wealth from the lenders to the consumer borrowers, then the marginal propensity of these lenders to lend to the business consumer uh, business borrowers is much lower which could in uh, that way lead to a reduction in the businesses willing and uh, willingness and ability to invest in their own businesses leading to the uh, fall in human capital so while the level of debt outstanding may not have an effect the uh, coverage ratio might still have a role in terms of lenders willingness to finance investment well, that's a good point, and I, the, and I didn't mention that, of course, if you, get, if you get a default where there's a wealth transfer from a person that has a low marginal propensity to consume to somebody that has a high marginal propensity to consume, something similar to like what you're, not just productivity, but let's think, just take that case, then you will have an effect on aggregate real wealth because, according to Keynesian theory at least, the propensity to consume would increase it, right? So I, I did abstract from that. You're very, you're very correct in that. And I'm just, I'm just thinking that's kind of a second order effect rather than a first order effect. Right. But, it, but the second yeah. order effect would yeah. dominate if you have. Yeah, but it's not going to be an effect that would cause the real wealth to real wealth to decline by 50 percent. And that's what we see happen, right? In in 2007, 2000, we, aggregate real wealth went down by 50 percent. That's, I don't think. The, although I agree with you about the that's a, that's an effect, I don't think it's big enough to have caused that. Thank you. Yeah. Back. Yeah. Okay. Uh, perhaps I can uh, counter what the earlier questioner said and say that actually what you're saying does have a ring of truth about it to me. 
if we ask why did the value of human capital go down, could you argue that perhaps this had something to do with the huge migration of people in China from the country to cities and their increased productivity, which made the value of workers in the United States less, sure, value think- of human capital for workers in the United States less. And this was going on during the period of time we're talking about. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree. I think that could be a factor. I, you know, the, we, don't really, we don't really know enough about human capital to sort it out because we really can't run regressions or collect data. I'm just you know, speculating about that impact. But sure, the, the value of the competition from labor income from other countries could affect the value of human capital in the United States. I'm not sure that would that still work for all the other countries that engaged that underwent a similar crisis, including China itself, and you know at least during 2008 and and many other countries around the world. I'm not so sure about that, but uh, that's possible. Yeah. Time. Okay, one more question. Yes, sir. The productivity in the two sectors. Well, that's kind of a question: is why it is that you get a if you get a bigger public sector, you get a reduction in wealth, right? I mean, I don't know what the real reason is, but one might be productivity differences in the public and private sector. Yeah. So I don't think we I don't think we really know why a bigger public sector in this mid range causes a reduction in wealth. That's an empirical fact, but people debate about what the real reason for that. If, if, if it's just wealth, if, it, if, if the government just taxes somebody and just hands it over to somebody else, you wouldn't expect there to be any effect, right? Yeah. No, Unless, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 